And now I have the pleasure and the honor of introducing Dr. Emily Teeter. Emily is a research associate and curator at the Oriental Institute. She received a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the U of C. Did I get that right? Yes. <coughs> and she's the author of a wide range of <coughs> scholarly and uh, popular articles that have been published in the U.S. and abroad. She served as a consultant for the Seattle Art Museum on our own Arts Institute of Chicago and has appeared in a wide variety of film and television productions dealing with the ancient Near East. Among her special interests are pre-Islamic and Islamic architecture and the formation of the modern Middle East, certainly an interesting subject at the moment. She has widely traveled in the region and developed and led many tours to uh, at least Egypt, Arabia, Turkey, Syria, and Tunisia. She's the president of the American Research Center in Egypt. During reunion weekend, many of us attended and liked uh, the exhibit at the Oriental Institute, which Emily curated, called Before the Pyramids, Origins of Egyptian Civilization. And this exhibit runs another two weeks or so till the end of the year. Emily's going to talk to us about the exhibit and whatever else is on her mind. <laughs> So, Dr. Teeter, thanks very much for participating in this first alumni webinar. Thank you very much. And I thank you for the invitation, Howard, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, when Howard was asking me about the exhibit um, before the pyramids that, as he mentioned, is at the OI for another two weeks until the end of the, end of the year, um, I wanted to take a look at what information we can tease out about the society that made these artifacts that are on exhibit at the Oriental Institute. The show uh, features objects from about 4000 BC to 2600 BC. And so what do these objects tell us about people in Egypt at that time? So one of the joys and surprises, really, of um, studying history is the realization that people of the past, even the very distant past, in this time period we're talking about with Egypt, we're not that terribly different than we are in many, many different ways. And what I want to specifically refer to is the connection between consumerism and status, and the role that objects have in creating personal identities, how personal possessions <laughs> uh, are emblems and indicators of social status and differentiation, how status can be associated with possessing a professionally made object, versus something that is homemade, and how consumerism has shaped society, in this case Egypt, nearly 6,000 years ago. And it's quite interesting looking at this material that we can really see the rise of specialized craftsmen and how that influenced the formation of Egyptian culture. So by about 6,000 BC, there were settled communities um, which would replace the hunter-gatherers in Egypt. And from this period, we start having some really pretty good evidence in Egypt. For example, it's been suggested from the very fine quality of the early pottery, as this example, that the first specialized craftsmen emerged in about 4,000 BC in the Nile Valley, so 6,000 years ago. What I want to do is look at the basis for that. But also, what is significant is that groups of people at this time emerged who were apparently full-time or primarily craftsmen and how this emerged so early in the Nile Valley. So this suggests that some groups of people were viewed as possessing the skills and being control of resources to produce things that other people wanted, but they themselves could not produce. This is really linked to the beginnings of social stratification in Egypt. We can see, for example, the differing sizes of tombs and their contents. For example, this very important tomb from a site called Hierakompolis, where the uh, the main tomb is surrounded by subsidiary tombs, which include animals and animal keepers. And this, so from this very early time, this is about 3500 BC, we can see social stratification. The person buried in tomb T16 had the ability to take people to the death with him and had control over these animal resources to have them buried around him. <laughs> Note that this is about 600 years before the invention of writing, and certainly about 500 years before the consolidation of the Egyptian state under a single king. So how do you account 
for this rise of craftsmen and this idea of status uh, reflected through objects. First of all, it's important to look at the geographic setting of Egypt. The real key to the rise of specialized craftsmen is that agriculture was relatively so easy in the Nile Valley. And unlike in other cultures, for example, Mesopotamia, the entire workforce was not required to produce food. Because as you probably know, the Nile flooded every summer from about July, so, uh, and then it receded in September. In this process, a whole new layer of very fertile land was deposited on the fields. Uh, the Egyptians could hold water back in basins. So you had really very, very easy agriculture. And uh, we can see from later scenes, here's a scene of the inundation, early 20th century. And we see many scenes in Egyptian tomb paintings <coughs> which show all the different stages in agriculture. And what we really get the impression is this is really pretty easy in Egypt, especially compared to, as I said, Mesopotamia, where it was a real struggle to feed the population. In Egypt, we have references to after the Nile receded, the farmer would go out and just strew some seeds around and then run a donkey back and forth over it to put it into the ground and then lay back and wait for the fields to come in, for the crops to come in. <laughs> so from at least 4000 BC, we can see the production of items that were made by specialists for others. This is again this idea of the rise of specialized craftsmen. The evidence that we have for this is, first of all, uniformity of design. These are three basalt pots from about 4000 BC. Basalt is sourced from only one area in the northern part of Egypt. These are from the southern part of Egypt. So we have people going in search of very specific materials, high value prestige materials, because you can make, you can easily and very rapidly make pots out of, out of pottery. But here, even by 4000, they're making these very elaborate pots, which show a lot of investment in their creation with the uh, creation of the little pedestal uh, foots, the lug handles, there's a lot of extra work that's going into the production of these. In other words, people even this early want something different. They want something special. And apparently they are prepared to the equivalent of pay more for these sorts of objects, presumably because possessing these objects gave the owner status. So we see over and over again, for example, this is a, a redware dish from about oh, roughly 3400 BC. <laughs> um, first of all, a uniformity of design. We find many, many examples of these indicating that these are not being made on a household basis because if they were, you'd expect to see a lot more variation. They're standard types, so they're coming out of these big workshops. Also, the growing complexity of these objects, for example, uh, using material like shell, which requires extra effort to obtain. So what we're seeing is really the birth of commerce and commercialism and consumerism. And by that, I really mean that the consumer expressed a sense of preference for one style of, for example, pot over another style. And that goods, through their rarefied material or level of decoration, expressed the taste, status, and prestige of the owner. So consumerism emerged in the southern part of the country first and gradually spread north in the Nile Valley. This is probably, um, we can trace this because there is originally a style of pottery in the north, a different style in the south, and the southern style becomes the uniform, um, the uniform style that is used throughout Egypt. And this is not so coincidental because at this time we also have the consolidation of the state under a, under a line of strong kings. They are from the south. And so they seem to be moving north and taking their culture with them. So let's take a look at how consumerism affected the material culture because we can see two different types of production. One is production for the elite who are presumably commissioning specific objects, and then mass production for the masses. So again, pottery is a very important record in Egypt. It's one of the most ubiquitous objects from Egypt. It's found in virtually every grave. The prehistoric examples like this are often simply made, but even at this point, they're showing extra steps. For example, this one is burnished, so it's a whole other step of rubbing this pot with a little uh, piece of leather or perhaps a pebble to bring up the, uh, the shine of it. Some are impressed with patterns that seem to imi imitate leather vessels. 
And again, so we get this idea of a demand for a certain look because we find many examples that are virtually the same. So even at this time, there's a desire for something special, attractive, and something that required more resources for its production. So the value placed upon pottery is reflected by its presence in burials, as I've already mentioned. Now, it is, as I said, one of the most common objects that we find in burials. Some of it was probably functional. Some of it, in fact, has been found with grain or different types of material in it. But oddly enough, there are other examples of pottery uh, discovered in situ that were placed in the tomb empty. This is an indication that it was not the functionality of the container, but actually the container itself had some sort of value. And so it was, it was so prized, it was taken into the tomb. Some of these might have even had amuletic uh, significance that we'll take a look at in a minute. <laughs> Again, the uniformity. This is called a black top redware cup. And we have hundreds of these in the basement of the Oriental Institute. You know, again, an indication not only of the specialized workshops, but apparently the taste that there was a demand for this style of cup. Otherwise, it probably would not have continued to be made for about 400 years. We see this also with another style of pottery that's featured in our exhibit. This is called, brilliantly called, decorated ware, is what the archaeologists call it. But this is a very interesting case in point. This style of pottery, and you can see it's really the shape are very uniform. They have high shoulders and a, and a um, nipped in base. Um, these were made over about 600 years with very, very little variation. The only decoration, the decoration on them is always in this red ochre. And so there's a very interesting kind of communication between the consumers and the producers that there apparently is a demand for this exact style of pottery. 500 years is a very, very long time for there to be essentially no change in the production of any sort of object. And so although this is before writing and we don't know the details, there's clearly a lot of interplay between supply and demand for this sort of pottery. It's also very consistent with the decoration. You can see the major motif are large boats probably funerary boats with the oars, um, the mountains on either side of the Nile Valley, maybe water, uh, rectangular motifs, which are probably dried hides to wrap a body in. So these tend to be, we think these are funerary in nature. And as I mentioned before, what's very interesting about these is that many of these discovered in situ were, were discovered in the tomb empty. So it's the value of the pot. Going back to also the idea of people expressing their status through extra work required to make a, an object or special materials, these are a very good example of that. The other pottery that I showed you was made out of clay that was obtained right by the Nile. So very easy, very accessible. Anybody can get it. You just go down to the Nile. Everybody lives close to the water anyway. Dig up some clay, take it back, and you make pots out of it. This pottery is made out of a clay. It's called marl. And it is mined up in the mountains, um, far away from the Nile. And so here again, we have this much greater investment in materials for these sorts of pots. So these are high prestige items. Not only was the material harder to obtain, but also they had to develop whole new systems of kilns for firing this pottery, because marl has to be fired at a much higher temperature than the other. And so they're actually developing closed kilns. So what you're seeing are high value prestige items, which again are in uh, demand for 500 years. So we can also see that some materials had more status than others. And this is based on the economic assumptions based on scarcity of material, diff difficulty of obtaining materials, and the difficulty of working those materials. So a, a good example, these are more examples of these wonderful pots. A good example of this is the stone vessel industry that grows up at this time. These um, could, of course, be made out of pottery very easily, but they're not. You can see the variety of the stone. So this is an example where craftsmen are going out in search of very specific 
types of stone that's being valued for its coloring, for its, the patterning. Um, and so again, we're seeing prestige items reflected by the material. But what's quite interesting is we also see this going in, in a different direction. This is a red Brescia vessel. It's about this big, beautiful, beautiful piece. Again, the, the veining of the stone is fabulous. The artisan was consciously you know, working to get the best stone with the best patterning. And the thing that I think is so amazing is this is an imitation of a really cheap beer jar. This style of jar with this pointed bottom is characteristic of beer jars. And those are made by the zillions out of clay. And the, when you see the clay examples, they're very roughly made because they're just containers. They don't really have much value. We start seeing them made, made in huge, huge numbers, about 3,400 with the industrialization of making beer. This is when we start getting a lot of beer making in Egypt. And so what somebody's done is done the sort of ultimate show off Instead of having a crummy little clay beer jar, they have commissioned one out of very, very luxurious materials, just to show off. Other examples, the, these sorts of stone, this is porphyry, again, from the eastern desert. This vessel is about this big. And so high, high prestige item. These uh, sorts of clay um, stone vessels were made, I'll show you the the tools in just a few, few moments, but you have to imagine the huge investment in time making these stone vessels and what it meant for the owners of these vessels. You know, why they're doing this is to basically show their status through their possessions. We also see some very interesting things. This is a clay version of a stone jar. You can see they're the same shape. And so this is, um, Probably what's going on here is the one on the right, the, the pottery one, the, the spirals are supposed to be an imitation of the bold patterning of the Brescia. And so this is a cheap knockoff of an expensive one. So if you're wealthy, the equivalent of wealthy, you can have the really nice one, but you can have a substitute. And so it's like, you know, having the, um, the really good handbag and then having the knockoff, the cheapy knockoff. It's, so it's interesting. And this is, this is uh, 3200 BC. That you're already getting that kind of mindset and that sort of sense of consumerism in the Nile Valley. It's very, very clear <coughs> that stone vessels are a big indicator of status. This is just a small group of vessels from one particular tomb. And I think there was something like 63 stone vessels in this tomb. It's sort of wretched excess. And, uh, and many of these were, as I mentioned several times, empty. And so these were not necessarily functional containers. So not only considering the source of the stone, which could be very, very difficult <coughs> to obtain, but the labor, <laughs> excuse me, that goes into making these. This is a wonderful scene a little bit later showing a stone working shop. There have been experiments done uh, using replicas of ancient Egyptian tools to make a three inch tall, three inch diameter stone vessel took over 22 hours. And so when you're talking, and that's a, that's a fairly soft stone, so when you're talking about the porphyry and the brescia, you're talking about a huge amount of investment in time. And so here we have, we'll look at a, a diagram of this. This is the main woodwork, uh, stone working tool. It's called a wobbly drill. It's a piece of wood with an offset handle, bags that create centrifugal force and downward pressure. It is socketed into a copper bit. And here it's actually showing making one of these stone cylinders. The, uh, the copper bit is not actually doing the most of the, uh, the cutting because they put a uh, powdered quartz or crushed quartz in with the bit and that really creates the cutting. And so then we have men finishing. Here another wobbly drill. So there's no uh, mystery of how they're making these. We, we don't have actual wobbly, wobbly drills, but we have many images of them. And some of these, this is one from on our, our exhibit, very, very thin walled, very, very thin walled. And here you can see the marks of a rotary tool that were used to hollow out the interior of this. So it was probably some sort of, um, like a spade-shaped hand tool that they would 
turn because they don't have have lathes or anything like that during this period. It's all just rot uh, rotary with uh, manual tools. And some of these stone vessels were made in just spectacular shapes. This is not in our collection. This is in Cairo. This is an obsidian bowl, a wonderful thing showing hands on the bottom of it. And so again, you know, the meaning of these pieces and the, the, the market for these is quite astounding. <coughs> so it's clear the accumulation display of resources was an important part of status. And it becomes very clearly a way of differentiating oneself oneself from other people. And so from this time, they're really, possessions are an important thing, is part of your sort of self-characterization. It was also a very important part of the rise of kingship in about 3100, because from this time with the rise of the first kings, not yet called pharaohs, uh, they differentiated themselves by their dress. For example, you might be familiar with the false beard that the king wears, or crowns, the, the name enclosed in a certain device, ways of showing this is a king, you're not a king, this is what a king looks like. And of course, this, this can be kind of tricky to do in a, in a society where writing has just begun, and in any case, the level of literacy throughout Egyptian history was very, very low, about 2 or 3%, and so you had to use different devices to make very clear who was the person of status and who were the retainers. We see from this time, certainly, that the kings have a monopoly over resources and the best craftsmen. And this is, again, a marker of his, of his own status and him being essentially the ultimate consumer. From the time of the pyramids, a little bit later, we have just ridiculous exhibits of wealth, for example, in the underground burial chambers of the Step Pyramid uh, at Saqqara, Step Pyramid of Djoser. There were something like 20,000 stone vessels, and many of them empty. And so just this huge stockpiling, again, a way of reflecting status. The objects from the tombs of the first kings are really some of the best evidence of how the king expressed his status by uh, possessions. This is an absolutely spectacular small stone bowl. It's about three inches high, beautifully, beautifully done. The interior follows the profile of the exterior. In other words, it's all undercut on the shoulders. Clearly, some of the finest craftsmanship. And so we think this is probably coming from the royal workshops or this sort of example, again, where the craftsmen are very carefully selecting the stone for its color and its patterning. So again, very, very fine workmanship. This is coming from royal tombs. Or other examples we have, the first kings were buried at a site called Abydos, which is in southern Egypt. And the tombs of the first kings were robbed repeatedly, and they were eventually even lit on fire. They were excavated at the beginning of the 20th century, and they've been excavated twice since, and amazingly, finding more and more little pieces. Now, because the tombs were so thoroughly robbed, we don't have anything other than these little glimpses, these little tantalizing hints of how rich these burials originally were. Hints like this, lots and lots of pieces of ivory, you know, ivory being a very um, prestige-laden, uh, hard-to-get substance. Most of it was being traded in from the south at this time. But these are ivory inlays that covered uh, furniture. So there was a lot of uh, veneering with ivory. And the thing that I think is so interesting about this is many of these ivory inlays are patterned to look like basketry. And I think, this is just a guess, but I think what's going on is we know that the furniture of the non-elite would be made out of like rattan or rush, that kind of stuff, like basketry. And so this is almost like Marie Antoinette and her little, and her little sheep, because here, the king has the most luxurious furniture covered with ivory, but it's patterned to look like uh, less uh, luxurious materials. Or ivory feet like this. This is probably from a little game board. Again, the combination of the skill of the craftsman and the access to these rare materials. And here you can see an example where we have the, uh, the carved feet, which is typical of Egyptian furniture. Or 
this is another example showing you how much workmanship is going into some of these. This is the backside of this with the mortise and tenons, uh, drill holes, a huge amount of work going in to producing this ivory furniture for the tombs of the kings. Or other little things. This is an absolutely elegant little game marker made out of pink, a pink stone. Um, this has been in our collection since about 1901, 1902. And just a couple years ago, the Germans re-excavating the royal tombs again found the rest of the set. It's amazing what, what shows up. But it's just a beautiful, beautiful little thing. Or an ivory game marker, another game marker. There were a lot of board games, apparently, in these, in these tombs. The Egyptians always liked board games. And this is a really beautiful little lioness. Um, she has a little collar, so apparently a, a tamed lioness, again an indication of the sorts of things that were in these tombs. This is a small fragment of a stone bangle bracelet. Very elegant. Again, uh, the resources to go get this stone and then to carve out a big block of stone into a little bangle is, is quite luxurious. And we see things that are very amusing. For example, the kings were buried with weapons, which of course are a reminder of their status and their role as a protector of Egypt. But in many cases, these are made out of not terribly practical materials, so ivory arrowheads. Well, maybe. But then we also have, for example, quartz, quartz arrowheads and, and, and uh, ebony arrowheads. So again, tr turning fairly utilitarian objects into objects which express wealth and status. Or the tombs also included material which has just plain intrinsic value. Copper was the means of exchange in ancient Egypt. And in these tombs, we found remains of a lot of copper. <laughs> this is a copper axe head from the tomb of King Kasakem. And so burying this in the tomb, taking it out of circulation, is basically like you know, taking all your Krugerrands and you know, burying them with you, taking them out of circulation. Because you can. Because you have this wealth, and you can take it with you. We can also see this in the non-royal sphere with objects <coughs> that are fancier than they need to be. For example, this wonderful stone vessel in the form of a, of a duck. And again, it goes far beyond utilitarian use. It goes to this idea of the desire for beauty, the desire for something that's special. So the other types of things, this, this is one of my favorite pieces in the exhibit. This is so beautiful. And because I'm a curator and I can handle these things, it's like velvet. It's just, the surface is just beautiful. And again, the interior is completely carved out and is polished on the inside. It's like just an incredible amount of effort going into this really spectacular little vase. We also see this sort of rise of embellishment in the private sphere. These are not from royal tombs anymore. This is a cosmetic palette. These were commonly placed in private tombs. You can see the remains of some red pigment that was ground in the middle. This is the earliest style. But again, as we see in the royal sphere, things getting more and more complicated, things getting more ornate as people are demanding something special, they start turning into different shapes, like a wonderful fish or a really great little elephant. By about 3200, we can see the rise of mass production for different audience. This is the, for the non-elite. And the main source, or the main evidence for this are these beer jars that I mentioned to you. And this is, this is actually a really nice example of these beer jars. Usually they're much, much rougher than that. But so we see uh, pottery workshops being dedicated specifically to bread molds, to beer jars, because they're turning these things out in huge, huge numbers to satisfy the, the demand. Now, another theme of the exhibit is that the fundamental aspects of Egyptian culture and art were established more than 500 years before the pyramids. And I think this is also partially due to this relationship between consumer and craftsman. People apparently wanted certain types of objects, certain specific types of objects, um, which led to an astounding sort of conservativeness and a permanence of representation. 
So in other words, I showed you the painted pots that didn't change for about 500 years. But we see this on a much larger scale also. For example, this is a ivory which shows a king. This is from the first dynasty, one of our early representations of a king. This is from, um, it's about 2,000 years later. You can see the, the tremendous similarity. Some of this permanence has to do with the Egyptian idea that the world was created by the gods and the initial patterns, because they were created by the gods, were perfect. And you don't mess around with what the, with what the gods created. The Egyptians actually believed that to wholesale change, there certainly was a lot of change in ancient Egypt, but generally change was not necessarily viewed as progress, like we would often view it, but it was viewed as corruption. And so you get this tremendous conservative nature through Egyptian art. This is a statue that was in our, our uh, galleries. It's had to go back to the Ashmolean. Beautiful, beautiful statue, Dynasty II, and here, 2,000 years later. Or here, a plaque from about 3100 BC, here, 2,000 years later. A nobleman being shown in exactly the same way. <laughs> or here, from our collection, a small ivory carving of a boy. Uh, children are shown naked and they are usually shown with their finger to their mouth because they don't differentiate people. You never see age, for example, in Egyptian art. So if you want to show it's a kid, you want to make the point it's a kid, the finger goes this way because otherwise you're not going to be able to tell what age uh, the figure is. But this is from about 3000 BC. This is from about 30 BC, 3000 years later. So I, I really think there is no other culture where you have this tremendous, this level of continuity in art and culture. So Egyptian consumerism shaped the society and its material heritage. When you think about museums throughout the world, and there are so many museums that are stuffed with ancient Egyptian artifacts, you think about the output of Egyptian craftsmen for their clients, and again this relationship between demand and supply. As already stated, material culture was very closely tied to the king's expression of his power and the power of the state. So not surprisingly, when the economy was good, things really started getting ornate in ancient Egypt. <laughs> For example, <coughs> in the Old Kingdom, the time of the pyramids, it's about 2600 BC, the style of clothing generally was very simple. Women wore a very, well, the representation is probably not the reality, but the representations show women with very, very tight, like sheath dresses with broad shoulder straps, and the men in a wraparound kilt or a kilt like this with an inverted, inverted pleat. By about 1400, 1500 BC, when the economy is really sort of go-go in ancient Egypt, a lot of gold being imported, we see the elaboration in dress. So there's really this sort of Again, conspicuous consumption. There is more money in the economy, and they're using that to produce more ornate versions of what they previously had. So here we have multiple layers, and this is to show that the linen is so fine that you can actually see through it, but little t-shirts and stuff that you would have never seen before. Or here, by about <coughs> 1200 BC, women's clothing getting extremely ornate with long pleated dresses, colored sashes, um, shawls, uh, lots of jewelry. Again, a reflection of the economy of Egypt during that time. The contents, one of the best examples of conspicuous consumption and what happens in a society like this where a lot of the equivalent of, of wealth comes into the society, are objects from the tomb of King Tutankhamun, who was discovered in 1922. Um, this is really our clearest image of consumption and the heights of excellence achieved by the craftsmen as they turned out these just incredibly lavish objects. This is a view of the tomb as it was discovered in 1922, so it was like Fibber McGee's closet. It was just jammed with thousands and thousands of objects. Things like this, um, a gold pectoral. This actually has the name of the king uh, in a rebus writing. But the level of craftsmanship, the, the sheer kind of baroqueness of it, 
the huge amount of work that's going into making just one of these pieces. Or here, a headrest, which is a standard part of Egyptian furniture. Normally, they're made of wood. This one is made out of cast glass. It's the only example we have like this. So a super, super luxe object. Or an alabaster jar from the tomb. Again, you can see how very ornate this has gotten. You have heads of enemies of Egypt, uh, Bess, one of the gods, a, a lion with the name of the king. So just this really tremendously kind of rococo style that hits Egypt in about the year 1300 as uh, Egypt becomes really the great power, the greatest power in the Middle East. And so the king is demonstrating that power through the possessions that he has. So in conclusion, <laughs> I think it's thought provoking to realize the power of consumerism on an ancient society and that it even existed. Even at such an early time, there was a keen appreciation of aesthetic values and a desire to possess beautiful objects. This desire, in conjunction with the incredible skill and resourcefulness of ancient artisans, created the incredible artistic legacy of ancient Egypt. Thank you very much. I'd be very happy to answer questions, either from here or from the, yeah. Do we know, uh, perhaps from later times, that some of these objects were produced specifically for the tombs, or were they objects that perhaps were um, decorative and then brought to the tomb when the person um, died? The objects from tombs fall into a lot of different categories. There are some things. For, for example, the tomb of Tut is a good example because there's so much stuff in that tomb. And the materials in that tomb can be broken into several different categories. One is stuff that was used during his lifetime. So there are things that we know were used for him because they're like things that were downsized for a kid because he came to the throne when he was like eight. And then there'd be little chairs and then big chairs. Certain things that had an early version of his name, an indication that he actually used those before his name was changed. So one category, stuff he actually used. There are uh, objects that were made specifically for the tomb. For example, pieces of jewelry that are just so incredibly fragile that they could not be worn. Uh, there are a lot of ceremonial objects, ritual objects, which presumably were being made for the tomb and not used in daily life. And a lot of objects we simply don't know. We can't tell. So it's a, it's a real mishmash. There are also things like, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, jars of wine. And so those were, actually, many of those predate his death by quite a bit because they actually have vintage years on them. They have years on them and tells, tells what, what uh, winery they're from, what part of the country, and if it's very good wine or sweet wine or that kind of stuff. And so it's a real combination of stuff, of different preparations. Mm -hmm. And the pottery pieces that you showed us early, um, those are not made on a wheel, I'm assuming. Thank you for asking. No, there is no potter's wheel in Egypt at this time. So it's all hand. It's all hand. It's, it's main, mainly coil, uh, mainly coil, sometimes slab. Sometimes um, uh, they will make a recess in the ground and sort of use that as, as a mold. But the most, there is no wheel, but it looks like they're probably making some of these pots on maybe a square of, of leather or something that they can turn by hand to just sort of work on the, on the rims, but it's, it's not even a slow wheel. It's because just a turning device. The uniformity of shape is really amazing. Yeah, it is. If each one was individually hand yeah. produced. It is, and it's and again, the it's, the sign, it's, it's almost again, it's the, it's the supporting evidence that we have, these are being made by you know, specialized workshops, that these are not home, homemade because this, the consistency is just tremendous. Um, I remember your Chaldean exhibit, which was actually even earlier times. Did you find in, in the, the Ur stuff the same kind of progression in consumerism? Uh, I, kind of I am an Egyptologist, and I, I don't think I can comment on the, on the material from Ur. I, I don't know enough about it. I don't want to guess. So. so yeah. Also, are there, is there any evidence of individualizing the artisans? Oh, very good question. Almost all Egyptian art is anonymous. There are only a few things that are signed. 
Uh, it also helps explain the uniformity of the art because, for example, a tomb wall will be the product of a whole bunch of people working. Uh, the craftsmen were so specialized that there would be one man who would come in and put the grid lines on the wall, another one that would come in and do the, the basic outline, another one would come in and correct that outline, another one would put the color, another would do. We, have, we know this because we have, first of all, unfinished things where you can see the different stages, but also there are specific titles for different, different uh, professions in crafts. And this is a reason, another reason why the art is so uniform, because you really don't have much opportunity for one craftsman to say, wow, I'm going to try something different. You know, you, you don't see the inspiration of a single craftsman because they work in groups. Now, obviously, there are some things that are made by a single person. But it's, it also says something about the, the, um, the role of Egyptian art. You know, it's not about the craftsman. It's about the product or the consumer. Um, and of course, there are other ancient cultures where we do know names of craftsmen. So we do, I'll back up, we know the name of a lot of craftsmen, but we don't know who's making what because they're not signing individual commissions. They're one of the walls at Abu Simbel actually does have the guy's name on it, very, very rare. That's and much the, It's much, much later. And the, the um, artisans were very well respected. They, this was a, a good profession. Usually, uh, boys followed their fathers in, into the profession of artist. Uh, very little evidence for women in the arts other than weaving. Also, we have lots of evidence for royal workshops that were attached to the palace. And there are autobiographical texts, people talking about the king uh, came and inspected. The king gave me the sarcophagus, and he himself came and watched the progress of it. And the king said, you should paint that blue, you know, that kind of stuff. So the, the king's, it's, it, there's a lot of um, patronage, patronage going on, because a lot of the private tombs, a lot of uh, sarcophagi, false doors, big, big value things. Um, we do have <laughs> texts that talk about those being gifts of the king. Not all of them, but occasionally. And that was a really big deal for the king to give you something. All right. First of all, folks online should send Irving an email yeah. if they have a question. You getting any? Yeah. No, we haven't got any. Okay. Well. My question is, I'm in, in the modern world, vehicles are uh, one of the big indicators of status. Are there okay. any vehicles found? Not necessarily ah, motor sure, vehicles. Sure, sure. Chariots. Okay. Chariots. Tut in the tomb of Tut, I think there were six okay. chariots, and they're all covered with gold. They're rattan covered with gold sheet. It's exactly the same thing going on. It's like, you know, the Maserati versus the, uh, versus the Chrysler. You know, the king is, you know, he must be a king. Look at the gold chariot going by, you know. Nowadays, people don't put their Maserati in their tomb, you know, why are they, <laughs> <laughs> why are they burying everything expensive with their being so selfish? <laughs> well, the, the underlying reason is that the Egyptians, of course, believe in life after death. And if you're a good person, you're reborn, you need all the stuff. I think they lack proof. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the underlying... Uh, the underlying theology is you, you have the grave goods because you're going to use this stuff in the afterlife. But you really need six chariots? Yeah. Is there any evidence of how many people were involved in the crafts? Like, like what percentage of the population and, and maybe if they got, how much they got paid and so forth? Um, what percentage of the population? I have no idea. We do have uh, some pay records, but from a very short period of several hundred years, there was a, a settlement, a town at, um, in ancient Luxor, Thebes, called Dero Medina. It was a town that was specifically built by the state to house the artisans who were building the royal tombs. Again, this is something about the status of these artisans. So they are taken care of by the, by the government. This town is walled. They're got the, the artisan's job is to do beautiful stuff. So they have, the government supplies people to bring them fish, to bring them the food, bring them water. Their job is to create. And we do, I believe we might have some pay stubs from that. But offhand, I don't remember. Um, well, we do know the, the artisans were paid primarily in grain, because throughout most of Egyptian history, 
grain was the main means of exchange. Copper was important also, but, but it'd be paid in grain and they'd be paid in excess of what their family would need, so then they barter the excess for the stuff that they want. And we have lots and lots of texts talking about, uh, they would do private commissions in their own time, these workmen that worked for the state. And so a guy would build a coffin and then trade it to somebody else in the village for you know, a couple statues or whatever. And there have been some very interesting economic studies done recently of the relative price of you know, what did a coffin cost, you know, how many man hours, what you could trade it for. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And it's all, it doesn't seem that different. It's just the trappings are different. I was wondering uh, where one put the point of the uh, beer vessels. Uh, they must have been. You put, put them in the ground, you put them in the sand, or they're also um, round uh, stains. You put them in. So they're, they're, uh, there are like raffia stands and also pottery stands, jar stands. So they get fancy too, the stands? Not. The pottery ones don't, although sometimes they're burnished. But by the, by the New Kingdom, by the time of Tut and those guys, the, the, the raffia stands do get fancy. They get ornamented with a whole bunch of flowers, you know, wreaths on them and stuff like that. So, yeah. Most. Most stuff during the time of Tut got really rococo. New Kingdom. Yeah, New Kingdom. Yeah. And they were aping old kingdoms. It's a little bit later is when they really start doing that, in like the like the twenty sixth dynasty, where they, in some cases we can't we can't tell some things if it's Old Kingdom or if it is um, twenty five hundred years later, because they're doing such a good imitation, and this is again this idea of reverence for the original patterns. Were there um, musical instruments in these tombs? Yes, there were lots of musical instruments in, in the tombs. And music was a big deal in ancient Egypt. A couple years ago, we did a fun show at the Oriental Institute, which was basically restoring the professional and private life of a temple musician, a woman whose body is at, her mummy is at the OI. Um, yes, they were, um, music was an important part of cult, because the, the gods were thought to be placated by music. They liked music. And you also see lots of banquets with people drinking a whole lot and playing and dancing. And the Egyptians, Egyptians had fun. I mean, they were a fun-loving people. So the, the main instruments were different percussion instruments like frame drums, big, almost like conga drums you'd hang around the neck, uh, clap sticks, uh, double, uh, double flutes, oboes, uh, side-blown flutes, uh, lutes, lyres, harps, a couple different kinds of harps. By about <coughs> 1300, 1400 BC, we start seeing uh, the importation of, of uh, different types of instruments, like lyres and things that are not indigenous to Egypt, start coming in, presumably through contact with uh, Greeks. Mm -hmm. that, as you describe, a kind of collectivism, you might say, amongst the artists. Mm -hmm. Is that true in other areas and elements of Egyptian society? I, I think you could say, I think I would say yes, because the society is, as we can reconstruct it from, we have a huge amount of written information about the society. People were very concerned about um, fitting in, about um, the overall good of the community, <coughs> at least that's the theory. I mean, that's the ideal that we get the, the texts about. And so there was, there was a sense of collectivism with that. Um, people were thought to be respons responsible very much for their own actions. Um, so that we do get this sort of dichotomy where they are uh, egocentrically uh, commemorated with their name and job title on their coffins and all the rest of their stuff, but then there's always this thing about how they fit into society. And there are wonderful texts that talk about the ideal man in society. For example, he doesn't raise his voice. He's calm. He doesn't cheat. He doesn't steal. He uh, respects authority, that kind of thing. Nothing. There's, there's a wonderful stela in our, in our um, galleries that has a long text on it. And this man writes, um, I, <coughs> I plowed with my own oxen. I sailed with my own boat. I, something, something, not with what I got from the hand of my father. <laughs>
which is a very, again, a very modern kind of concept, this idea of the self-made man. And what, I mean, that was really the ideal in, in Egypt was, um, and it's also, it's, it's not, there are a bunch of other surprises too. For example, when people got married in Egypt, they moved, ideally they moved out of their parents' house. So you don't have these big extended families like you would expect to have, first of all in the Middle East, but also in an ancient society. Ideally, you, when you marry, you go out, you found a house. In fact, the, the word to get married, one of the terms is to found a house. Um, so there are some kind of surprises also in the, in the society. One being that women had the exact same legal rights as men, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, prob yeah, probably so. But it's women could institute divorce. Women could ser uh, could uh, give testimony in co courts. Uh, women held their own property uh, before and after marriage. So it's really it, there's some real surprises in this culture. Well, nothing, uh, nothing from the okay. Then maybe just one more question, and yeah, how are you? I wanted to, well, it's the last question. I want you to talk about modern Egypt. Well, oh, whether I, these artifacts are are in danger or not? Uh, I was just in Egypt a week before last, or about no, about three weeks ago. I was in Luxor and in Cairo, and um, the artifacts are not in danger. Uh, after the rev after the uh, revolution, January twenty five. There were some issues, as you, you probably read about the Cairo Museum, and that was very poorly handled because it was, it was first stated, oh, nothing, you know, nothing happened, and then all the news footage is showing you know, broken artifacts on the floor. It's like you know, big credibility problem. The, the damage at the Cairo Museum was m minor. You know, it's bad, but it's, it's minor. A bigger difficulty was with the sort of breakdown of the government. The guards that were hired to uh, be security over the uh, storehouses because there there are storehouses all over Egypt that are associated with excavations. When people excavate, when they find things, it goes into that storehouse or it's called a magazine. And some of those magazines were broken into. But since then, the security situation is is really quite good. Um, our we have two expeditions in the field right now. Everything's going normally. When I was in Cairo. It was very surprising. Um, it was right before the elections when it was really there. There was that whole new set of demonstrations down in Midan Tahrir. I was staying out at Giza, which is about half an hour, 40 minutes away. You would have never known anything was going on. If you're not right at the epicenter, you'd never know anything's going on. You know, you go six blocks away, life is normal. So the biggest issue is, of course, you know, what's going to happen. Um, in the last year, a big issue for archaeologists was um, with the breakdown of the government and there being no government, there was a big problem with our archaeologists because they couldn't get permissions to go into the field because nobody wanted to take responsibility. The, uh, the head of the Supreme Council kept on being hired and fired and quitting and hired and fired and quitting. Zahi, yeah. And so that was the biggest problem that um, you couldn't get the administrative okay to go into the field. But um, in September, suddenly the committees just started meeting like mad in Cairo and, and generating the, the permissions. And so um, I don't really know of any expeditions that are compromised by the situation right now. It's a very interesting contrast to Syria. Syria, nobody's working in right now. The uncertainty there is just too great and the, the violence. Um, so it's, it's so sad because Syria is such a wonderful place and fantastic archaeology going there. But that's a country that has really been impacted by the uh, Arab Spring, that uh, nobody's going to Syria right now. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.